Good afternoon, everybody, and a very, very warm welcome to um, the MPN Voice Forum, which is based from, uh, well, I'm actually in West Sussex, but we have the consultants from the Clatterbridge uh, Cancer Centre, the Countess of Chester Hospital, and, and North Wales. I'm sorry, I can't pronounce the name correctly, so I'm not going to try. But um, I'm delighted to see everybody, and thank you for joining us. Just a few housekeeping um, to begin with. Please ensure that your first and last name are showing to help us move you into the right breakout group. Instructions will be posted in the chat. Uh, please note this meeting is being recorded, excluding the breakouts. If you do not wish your face to be shown on the video and uploaded to YouTube, please turn your camera off during the talks. Uh, there's still a chance to submit your questions to the panel. Please use the chat function to send your questions at any time during the event, and we will do our best to answer as many as possible. Um, and I, I will say this now, and I'll probably have to say it again later on, but we cannot answer any questions about your personalized treatment plans um, for those you need to speak to your consultant. One other big favor, please remain on mute during the talks and when you're not speaking during the breakout group session. One other thing, we would be really grateful if you could fill out the feedback survey as we are always trying to improve our online forums. First of all, I really want to also thank the clinicians who are giving up time today to help and well, to do their presentations, Dr. Butt, Dr. Wells, Dr. Hartin, and um, the um, clinical nurse specialist, Steph Jackson. We're hugely grateful to you for your support. Um, I'm delighted to say that um, Dr. Butt is a very active member on our medical steering committee. Um, and it's always a joy for, for Maz and I, when we're on the road, to go and do the face-to-face -face forums up in, up in the Northwest. And we very much look forward to being in Chester next year. We also need to thank um, uh, Novartis for their kind support in, in putting the forum on. We've got a busy agenda, which I'm sure you've all seen. And so we will now go just through the intro slides to what MPN Voice is. This I'm doing in a rather rushed way because, because we've got a busy day, but I really also want to welcome some new attendees from Canada, France, California, Washington, and Oklahoma City, some of whom may not know what MPN Voice does um, and, and where we fit in the MPN community. Uh, we were started as a small group of patients in 2003 uh, with haematologists and specialist nurses and psychologists at St. Thomas's Hospital. We became MPD Voice in 2011. And then when the World Health Organization reclassified MPNs as cancers, we became MPN Voice in 2014. We work under the umbrella of Guys and St. Thomas's Charity, which is immensely important and supportive to us because they do all the charity guide, uh, clin uh, charity uh, compliance and all the things that really we as volunteers don't really understand. We, are, we have a committee. Um, we have, I am co-chair and we have Tim Ellis, our chief financial officer and Professor Claire Harrison, who's the medical director and John Mathias, our co-chair. We also have clinical advisory committees, a committee which Dr. Butt is on, um, and we have fundraising committees and a, a management committee. We're always, we're growing, and it's very interesting actually, because at the beginning of the dreadful pandemic last year, we suddenly had to get our act together because we weren't going to be able to go out in, in person and meet the uh, patients and the community. And so MPN Voice has under, undergone a rapid period of, of rapid growth in the last year, which has been very exciting for all of us. And I have to also say a thank you to Maz, because without Maz, as many of you know, um, this wouldn't be possible. 
coronavirus, um, we are constantly updating our website for in, with information on the current COVID-19 pandemic. You know, I also recommend uh, looking at Health Unlocked and Facebook because they all keep up to date as the situation changes. Uh, therefore, we are ensuring that the community has accurate information at all times. We also have a, a representative on the Cancer 52 Consortium um, of cancer organizations to ensure there is an up-to-date flow of consistent information between all the relevant stakeholders. MPN Voice has delivered virtual forums. We have also collaborated with Leukemia Care and to deliver a webinar. Health and wellbeing support and information, in particular the podcasts, specifically for MPN patients. We've noticed that um, there's been an increased amount of anxiety during the pandemic, and even now with the, the con slight confusion over vaccines. And the podcasts that are on our website are an excellent resource for getting some emotional support. We've conducted surveys, both national and international surveys, uh, with various organization to help establish a data-driven, rationalized clinical care, care approach for managing patients during the COVID pandemic. Coronavirus again, uh, the three major piece, pieces of research, response to infection, the vaccination and the vaccine effectiveness. Uh, these are things that have all been um, done by MPN Voice. Next slide, please, Danny, thank you. Uh, information, do you know, the information is critical here. When I was first diagnosed in uh, 1991, there was precious little accurate information. And our, our whole motto here at MPN Voice is to provide accurate information and support to the MPN patients, their families and the clinical community. Um, and doing that, we've got leaflets, uh, we have our YouTube channel, we have Facebook, we have Twitter, we have Instagram. We now have two new exciting things. I know I mentioned this uh, in Dublin a couple of weeks ago, but we have Mark Taylor, who is doing all our uh, Twitter and Instagram pages, which is really keeping people up to, as up to date as, as we can with the latest news from MPN Voice. We also have a, a young person's blog, which you will find Alice is doing, and it's on our website now. So if you look for uh, Alice's blog, um, I'm sure any young person with an MPN will get a lot of, a lot of reassurance from her blog. The regional forums. Well, you know, it's very, it is sad that we haven't been able to, to get out and about, um, but you know, the numbers speak for themselves. In 2020, last year, 1,600 people attended two virtual forums and two webinars. That is just amazing because, you know, putting them on YouTube and putting, you know, people put it, linking people to the website has given a lot of people a lot of comfort. Um, and this is growing, but, but we do recognize, and we did a survey amongst our members recently, we do recognize the need to be face to face again and how much patients get from attending these forums live. Our first live forum is scheduled to be in May next year, and that will be on the 21st of May in Galway. But we are already planning to be in Chester next year in September, and we look forward to seeing all the Northwestern patients in, in Chester then. Just look where MPN Voice is spreading to now. I've talked about the people who are attending today, but also, you know, we look, apart, look at this map and um, from being a small group of patients at St. Thomas's, um, you know, Claire Harrison said to me about a year ago, she said, from a small oak, a mighty forest has grown. And this is just absolutely wonderful because it is so supportive for anybody with an MPN and also for any clinician wanting to get up to date information. Um, and we're busy, we've got exciting plans for further developments, which uh, we hope to be able to tell you about soon. Research, this is key, this is really key. So often we hear 
um, people saying, well, how did I get it? Why did I get it? Um, you know, and funding research now is, is one of the principal things that we raise money to fund. Um, and these are a list here of the, the current trials that we're doing. And I suggest just look at them on the website because we do try and keep them updated. Mosaic, an extremely popular um, with the fit patients. This is an epidemiology study um, and we are now into the next phase of it. It's produced some really exciting results and, and clinical papers have been published, which are helping the clinicians worldwide. Um, and so we will continue to fund Mosaic and continue to update the patient community on the research results. Advocacy. Advocacy is another, uh, another area that MPN Voice is really expanding. Um, and we um, provide, it provides a voice for MPN patients. And, and in particular, and this is important, to represent them when decisions are, are made about drug funding and um, generally in the pharmaceutical in industry, ensuring patients are consulted as part of the clinical trial process for new drugs. Um, again, I, I would encourage you to look at the website again, because there's a lot going on in the advocacy a team with the advocacy team at the moment. Fundraising. MPN Voice, and this has recently become quite important to us, MPN Voice would not exist without fundraising, donations and grants. And we're very lucky today to have the grant from Novartis to help us uh, with forums. But we need these essential funds to research the, uh, to, to fund the research projects run for, well, not today, but run forums, funding the website development, uh, provision of printed resources, provision of support to the MPN community via Health Unlock, Facebook and Twitter, and general support to the MPN um, patient and healthcare communities. You know, one of the things that not going live to the patient forums has done is that we haven't had the donations, because normally when we go to, uh, to um, forums, people are incredibly generous when they hear of the work that we do. So any donation today would be really, really gratefully received. We're not alone. A lot of charities throughout the pandemic are finding it difficult to raise funds. You know, the fundraising, and it really is fun. You know, people, I know in the pandemic, people were doing sort of mini marathons in their, in their front rooms or gardens or, um, you know, but People can do anything as small as a sort of a Zoom knitting party or uh, once we're out and about, well, now we're out and about fully, tea parties, um, just fun, just things that are fun and get to know the community. I've just spoken about donations, but I would be so grateful if you could think and think about just giving uh, the just giving on the Just Giving page. The link is here and I know that it will be on the chat. It means an awful lot to an awful lot of people and we really want to continue to evolve MPN Voice. Thank you for your support. I'm now going to introduce uh, our first speaker, speakers. Uh, Dr. Norman Butt and Dr. Rachel Wells uh, from Liverpool, and delighted to welcome you to our MPN forum. You are going to talk about objective symptom assessments in MPNs, and then I think, Norman, you and I are going to talk about skin cancers. Welcome to you both, and thank you. Okay, that's great. If everyone can just uh, confirm that you can hear me all right. Uh, Nona, you can hear me all right. I can, thank you. Good, okay, excellent. Okay, well, thank you for the invitation to speak. It's lovely, this is uh, the first time we held this forum in Liverpool was in 2015. Um, and so we've held it every year apart from last year because of COVID. Um, and I have to say, it's lovely when you get together and meet uh, patients and MPN Voice face-to-face. -face. Um, so I'm Norman Butt, I'm consultant hematologist at Clatterbridge Cancer Centre. Um, in Liverpool. Um, I work alongside um, my colleague, Dr. Rachel Wells, 
And um, most recently, in the last six months, we've got a third colleague who works within MPN called Dr. Ingvar Floizand, who has come from Norway. And the three of us uh, lead the MPN service in Liverpool. So um, I'm going to talk uh, this afternoon. The first talk is going to be on objective symptom assessment in MPN. Sounds a bit of a mouthful, but I'll talk you through it. Uh, so what we're going to cover is what symptoms do patients with MPNs experience and why? And then is there a difference between the symptoms that uh, patients with the different MPNs uh, get? Is there a difference between um, any of the MPNs and the symptoms they have? Then secondly, we're going to look at is it important to actually measure or quantify these symptoms in some way? And if so, how can these symptoms be measured and quantified? And then finally, just how can patients and clinicians use this information? So the first survey um, that was ever conducted um, on symptom assessment in patients with MPNs was published in 2007. And it's a, a very, very large patient cohort survey of uh, nearly 1,200 MPN patients. Um, and it was an international survey, but it was headed by, you can see in the reference one, uh, Ruben Misa, who is effectively the sort of Steven Spielberg of, of MPNs in uh, internationally renowned, currently based in Texas. So he pioneered this and it was an internet based um, uh, symptom survey. Uh, a good spread of patients with PVET, and actually, if you know that the, the incidence of these conditions, a, a slightly higher proportion of myelofibrosis patients participated in the study, and that possibly, as you will see, probably reflects the fact that these patients are motivated because they are particularly symptomatic. And when uh, questioned as to what symptoms patients with MPNs reported, uh, these were in the top... Um, the, the, the sort of the, the top six most frequently reported symptoms across the MPNs. And you can see, and I think most of you would recognize that fatigue is a ubiquitous symptom amongst patients with MPNs, but also we have itch, or a medical term for that, pruritus, and you'll see that in some slides. So itch, night sweats, also a common symptom. And um, I qualify that as not... Uh, to, to, to be clear on what night sweats are, we're not talking about feeling just slightly hot at night. We're talking about actually, you know, drenching your, your, your night clothes, actually having sweats sort of dripping off your face. Very, very uncomfortable and unpleasant. Bone pain, another frequently reported symptom in patients with MPNs. And again, that's different. And this will deal with this in the panel Q&A as some, um, someone has asked a question about the difference between bone pain and arthritis. So bone pain is, very, is, is somewhat different to joint pains. We're not talking about joint pains, we're talking about aching, literally aching bones. Fever is, is another reported uh, symptom and also weight loss. Then if you look at the, the, the symptom um, uh, profile amongst um, the, the, the three uh, main MPNs, you'll see that across the board um, that um, MMM is actually, um, it's just another term for myelofibrosis. Patients with myelofibrosis, largely in every one of these bar charts, you'll see that patients with myelofibrosis are uh, more symptomatic, bar pruritus in every other uh, parameter, fatigue, night sweats, bone pain and weight loss, they are more symptomatic than patients with PV and ET. But nonetheless, you can see in the bar charts that PV and ET patients are also very symptomatic um, in all of these parameters as well. So yes, um, the, the, the symptom, um, if you like, the symptom frequency is maybe somewhat higher in myelofibrotic patients. That does not mean at all. It's uh, all patients with MPNs are, are uh, considerably burdened by by these particular um, uh, symptoms. And why is that? So um, in myelofibrosis, the main driver of patients' um, disease-related symptoms is a combination of the very bulky spleen that many patients with myelofibrosis have, and also um, the low blood counts which they experience, so anemia and low platelet counts. And that combination of of this overactive 
uh, this fibrotic bone marrow causing your spleen to enlarge to compensate for that and then the associated drop in blood counts because your bone marrow is ineffective is what contributes to the if you like the burden of of of, um, of symptoms in myelofibrosis the mechanism by which patients with ET and PV get symptoms is somewhat different. Theirs is because of vascular effects. So that is that the high blood counts uh, interfere with blood flow and they can interfere with blood flow on a macrovascular level, so in the bigger blood vessels, and also on a microvascular level, so in the very smallest blood vessels. And therefore, these patients are at risk of blood clots and, uh, and strokes and symptoms associated with, um, with, with, with vascular disease. And is it important to actually um, assess these symptoms in MPN patients? Well, I mean, the, the, the obvious answer is, is, is yes, it clearly is important to, to, to try and um, assess these symptoms. Um, and it's clear that when the internet-based survey in 2007 was, was performed, it was clear that, that the MPN symptoms significantly compromise patients' ability to function socially, but they're also, they're limited physically um, and to the point where it can interfere with even um, their, their, um, um, their, daily, their daily activities. And obviously as a consequence of all of those, their overall quality of life is, is affected. So it's, it, it, it is important that these symptoms are, are um, assessed um, and then indeed addressed. So what is the, so what's been the sort of evolution of how we've tried to assess patients' symptoms with, um, with uh, myelofib, with, with um, MPNs? So the first one was the quality of life questionnaire that came, um, that was part of the internet based survey. And that used three assessment tools. In a previous iteration of this talk, when I first gave this talk many years ago, I went into a lot of detail about the assessment tools. But actually, in truth, I don't think it's, it's particularly helpful six years on to actually go through that. I think it's enough to say there was three assessment tools that covered a whole range of symptoms, but there were 60 items in that. And that's fine in a clinical research setting. But in a practical setting, when you are in clinic, um, that clearly is not really a practical thing that patients would want to engage in um, and one that clinicians would be able to actively um, sort of um, document. As that 2007 survey showed that myelofibrotic patients were, the, were, were, if you like, more symptomatic than the ETPV group, that's not to say that those weren't, as I've covered, um, they then had a myelofibrosis, a myelofibrosis symptom assessment form, so a slightly... Um, a slightly more tailored assessment. So it's one tool, but it still had 20 items. And that was somewhat better than 60 items, um, but still probably less practical. And clearly as it was um, signposted as a myelofibrotic tool, it, it somewhat not applied to the other MPNs, which was then came up for a third iteration, which was the MPN symptom assessment form. So this time it's a form which included symptoms that are maybe as we've said, the two um, the mechanisms of symptoms are different in AMF and in and in ET and PV. So it sort of combined um, some of the symptoms that we got from the very first questionnaire that covered everybody and from MF and produced a, a, a third iteration which had twenty seven items. Um, and then finally, of those twenty seven items, again to make this a useful practical tool for clinical purposes. Um, they came up with what we have now, which is an MPN symptom assessment form, total symptom score, and that's known as MPN 10. And I wish if we were all face to face, I would get you in an audience to ask you to raise your hands and say, has anyone ever filled out an MPN 10? Um, but six years ago, um, a, a tiny minority of the, of, of, of the attendees had even heard of it, let alone completed it. And I suspect probably not many of you out there are doing this regularly, if at all. So this is the MPN 10, and these are the 10 symptoms which across the three MPNs were, um, were picked out as being the most um, clinically useful to, to um, assess um, patients from a, from a 
practical clinical perspective. So we have fatigue. I have to say, I'm, I think there are there are limitations. That there's limitations in any symptom assessment tool. Um, but I think that, I mean, this is trying to make the best of what we can do. I still think it's not brilliant, but I think it's, 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 it's the best we've got so far. But if you look, so the first item on this is fatigue, but it asks you to score your fatigue in the last 24 hours. And again, I'm not quite sure that you know, if if you are if you are not filling this out every day, why why pick the last twenty four hours? Because the other symptoms assessments, it's asked you how you're feeling over the how have you felt over the last week, and that to me makes much more sense. How have you felt fatigue wise over the last week? But anyway, that's my personal view. The questions that we'll ask are whether you fill up quickly, and that's called early satiety, and they're scored from zero where you have nothing, you have no symptoms, and ten, which is the worst possible. And um, so early satiety and abdominal discomfort you see in myelofibrosis because of a big spleen. Inactivity is part of fatigue. Fatigue leads to inactivity, but that is, is ubiquitous across all the MPNs, as is problems with concentration or brain fog. So again, zero to 10. Night sweats, um, significant night sweats, that's more of a feature of myelofibrosis, but can be seen in other MPNs. Pruritus, ubiquitous across them all, but maybe more so in polycythemia vera. Bone pain, again, in any MPN, but most commonly seen in myelofibrosis. I think fever is probably the weakest question in this MPN 10 score, because you either, as far as I'm concerned, you either had fever or you haven't had fever, and how you score a fever over the last week from a not to 10, and even I would struggle as to what in the name that, how can that be applied practically? And then unintentional weight loss over the last six months. Well, it's just said, have you felt over the last week? And then it says here, unintentional weight loss over six months, scored from zero to 10. So even now you can see it's not a perfect tool after all these iterations, it's still not perfect, but it's the best we have. And I think we have to work with what we've got. But this is what you, what, you might see there's different ways of collecting this. So what we used to do in Clatterbridge uh, pre-COVID was that before we had um, telephone consultations is we had face-to-face -face reviews and our clinical nurse specialists would, sorry, our healthcare assistants in clinic, any patient arriving in clinic, they, we had a pad of these, they would rip the pad off, hand it to the patient. The patient would score their symptoms with the help of the HCA and they got very used to this. And then at the end, um, they would pass this through, we would calculate a total symptom score and we would record it in the patient's notes. There are electronic tools and there was one, um, there was an app and, you know, we're in a, we're in a digital age and Novartis had um, an app recording um, patients' MPN 10 scores that you could then, so that's sort of an MPN 10 tracker. And it was in app form and it's a really badly named app and I keep getting told it and I keep forgetting it and the app is not even available on the uh, on, on, on the Apple Store or Android anymore and actually MPN Voice are looking to address that because we may actually MPN Voice may well even consider coming up with their own app and um, to record this but there is a digital so it's, but there is a web based version of the MPN tracker so if you literally type in Novartis MPN tracker you will come to this page and you can actually track your own symptoms um, using those, um, using the, 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 the 10 questionnaires, you, you fill them out and it actually tracks each symptom and records it in a diary form for you um, for clinical use. Um, so how do we implement this um, in terms of um, our day-to-day -day practice? Well, firstly, I want to try and get patients back into this because we were doing it religiously in our clinics when they were face to face. Now it's telephone. It is much, much harder for us um, to and for the best will in the world to 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 we ask patients symptoms. Do we actually formally record them in an MPN 10? We haven't been doing that religiously um, since since COVID. We need to get back to that. But for us to remember that we kind of need to the patients to remind the clinicians. So it's our responsibility as clinicians to ask you, how are your symptoms? Have you scored them? Um, have you heard of MPN10? And if you know about it, you can help us with that. But similarly, at the same time, if we're not asking you, you should be volunteering and saying, well, I've been monitoring my MPN10 and I've noticed that I'm suffering more fatigue than I have done in recent weeks, or I've noticed more bone pain. And we can correlate, the plan will be to correlate those symptoms with what we are seeing um, in your blood count parameters and clinical examinations. And that way, the theory is that we should be able to assess when, when your disease is starting to demonstrate features of being poorly controlled because your symptom burden will go up. 
But more importantly, is that we have patients who require treatment and we want to see that that treatment is actually being beneficial in terms of um, helping their symptoms. So it's about um, not just assessing the amount of disease they've got at any one time and saying, yeah, your symptom scores are going up. Clearly, there's something not right with your, with your condition. But also once you start treatment to get the impact of those treatments, are we actually making you feel any better or are we just making your blood counts look good? So I think that is important. So for those reasons, I would like you to just have a little um, dig around to see now that I've signposted you to MPN 10, you get an idea of what, um, what that might mean for you, get an idea of how you would maybe collect that information, how you would record it, and then how you would present it to your clinician. Um, and we would definitely be very, uh, very keen to, to get some feedback, and uh, maybe even in the Q&A as to how you would do that. Um, and, um, and, and, and how we embed this into our routine clinical practice. And it just shows that six years after I first gave this talk, it is still not embedded into routine practice. So to summarize then, um, that um, um, what symptoms do patients have? Well, the commonest symptoms that, that we see across all MPNs are fatigue, itch, uh, drenching sweats, bone pain, fever, and weight loss. And there is a difference between the symptom profile, and I've shown you in the MPN10, what symptoms are more weighted towards myelofibrosis and what symptoms may be more weighted towards ET and PV. Is it important to measure them? Yes, it is, because it's clear that these, all of these symptoms are impacting on patients' quality of life. So it is important to, to, to measure those. And how can they be measured? Well, after many iterations, the most practical method is using the MPN10. I really want that sort of embedded into people's, both clinicians and patients sort of um, uh, consideration of their, of their disease. And how can we use this information? Well, you can use it by signposting it to us to see something is not right with your condition or with your treatments. Um, and the way we would use it is to demonstrate the effectiveness of the treatments that we're using. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, if there are questions, please put those into the chat box and we will address them um, in the Q&A uh, session uh, at 3.20. But the next thing I'm going to go straight on um, and talk about is skin cancer and NPNs. So hopefully, again, all of you can... Um, can see this. Is that projecting all right? Okay, so um, I wanted to signpost this because it's something that, that we're seeing. I can't say that we're seeing more, um, more of this than, than before. I think we're, it's not that I think the incidence of these things is going up. I think just as clinicians, as patients, I think we are just more vigilant and more aware of um, the association between MPNs and skin cancer. But what I'm going to talk about in this talk, and it's not in any attempt to be alarmist in any way, uh, but I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about um, just MPNs and, um, and just cancers in general, particularly um, other cancers. Um, I'm going to then specifically deal with MPN and skin cancer because that's something that, um, that Dr. Wells and I see quite a bit of in, in, in clinical practice. And we're going to look at um, what treatments that patients have had with NPN and their potential risk of exposure of those treatments to their skin cancer risk. And then I was uh, looking for some patient um, representatives to actually speak, but we've got a bashful population in the Northwest and I couldn't get um, um, any particular patient that I, I came across in the last month or so who was prepared to uh, actually talk. So I'm very grateful that Nona is just going to talk a little bit about her experience of um, skin cancer and um, or yeah, skin cancer and MPN, and finally just a summary slide on some some basic tips and advice. So this is where I'm not trying to be alarmist, not trying to scare you, because un undoubtedly the you know cancer cancer is a very prevalent condition um, across the general population. So so you know people with when, without MPNs get malignancies, and we all know that. MPNs we know um, is technically classified as a blood cancer, as a blood malignancy, and um, a paper that was published um, just uh, just about a year ago now just looked at what evidence was there about MPN patients just getting if they've got this blood cancer, what is the risk of them getting any other cancers? 
And there is a suggestion that there may be a slightly higher incidence of other cancers in patients with MPNs compared to the general population. And we're looking at something like one and a half to three and a half times, depending on what cancer that, that they're actually looking at. But like I say, that is, in, in the grand scheme of things, it's not a huge increase in cancer risk compared to the general population. And it has to be put in context that cancer in general is, it, we're seeing more of it, we're picking up more of it. So I don't think as a, as a group, you need to be overly concerned. It's just something that you need to be aware of so that symptoms are um, any, unusual symptoms, um, that, that fact is borne in, in, into, in, into consideration. Um, all MPN subtypes are, are, um, are potentially affected, but, it's, uh, but it's, it's often you see the slightly higher cancer risk in, in the sub-80 year group um, range, uh, which is what the, the clinical paper highlighted. And it, was, it merely highlighted that clinicians and patients should be aware of this. Um, so that other so that symptoms are are taken um, um, taken into consideration or, or seriously. Um, so let's focus on MPN and skin cancers. So when a, when our second cancer is is um, or when a when a malignancy is picked up in MPNs, the 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 incidence of the second cancers. 20% um, of those second cancers are non melanoma skin cancers. Um, five percent of them are melanoma skin cancers. So you're looking at something like if there is a second cancer, about a quarter of them are going to be something related to the skin. Okay. So reasonably common. And what is the association between the treatments that you've got and skin cancer? So again, um, it depends on what literature you look at, but from what I have um, seen on the latest kind of um, uh, the latest kind of data suggests that hydroxycarbamide possibly gives you um, uh, two times a higher risk of non-melanoma skin cancer. So twice the risk compared to, to people who have not had um, exposure to hydroxycarbamide. So it kind of doubles your risk um, for non-melanoma skin cancer. And the SPC, that's the product characteristics, the insert that you get with the drug, actually says if you look, if you if anyone has diligently read through the SPC or you can just Google it, um, it says that patients should be advised to protect their skin from sun exposure. And in addition, patients should conduct self-inspection of the skin during treatment and after discontinuation of therapy and should be screened for second malignancies during routine follow-up visits. So there's a specific section in the hydroxycarbamide leaf that tells you that just to be vigilant for the risk of skin cancers. Ruxolithinib, the risk is higher than hydroxycarbamide and it's four, it's four times the baseline risk. And remember, the baseline risk is not huge. So, but, so it looks significant that it's four times uh, the baseline risk with hydroxycarbamide being twice the baseline risk, but the baseline risks are small, so it's four times a very small number. But in the SPC and ruxolitinib also says that non-melanoma skin cancers have been reported in these patients. Often those patients have a history of exposure to hydroxycarbamide, so they're, so they're not absolutely sure whether it's a ruxolitinib or whether it's, it's the previous exposure to hydroxycarbamide that did it. And so therefore they're saying we cannot say that it's a causal relationship, we cannot say that the ruxolitinib caused this. But again, it recommends periodic skin examination in patients on ruxolitinib because of that increased risk. Busulfan, we know, can increase the risk and a drug that I've never used, uh, but Pipobroman is also a drug that used to be used for MPNs. Used, both of these are used very rarely. We use busulfan occasionally. Um, the, the actual risk is not quantified, but it is, it is it's probably somewhere in the region of two to four, I would guess. And agrolide and interferon, I can't find any evidence that there's any association. So if you are on hydroxycarbamide and ruxolitinib, I think you should be aware, and, and busulfan, and I doubt any of you will be on piperobromam, uh, then you should be aware of that increased risk of skin cancer. And your risk of non-melanoma skin cancer, this is now just for the general population, is obviously fair-skinned people, those people who are exposed to excessive amounts of ultraviolet light, so skin exposure, sun exposure, um, chronic inflammatory skin conditions are listed as a risk factor, I'm quite sure. I mean, I think of chronic inflammatory disease as eczema, and I don't believe that's the case. But exposure to radiation certainly is, um, so x-rays, etc., cetera, uh, radiotherapy, and exposure to drugs. And we've just talked about hydroxycarbamide and ruxolitinib being two examples. There is a pre-cancerous, um, uh, so um, 
And so the, the so I'll go back here. The the melanoma, the non-melanoma skin cancers that you can get um, are squamous on the left here, a squamous cell carcinoma and basal cell carcinoma. There is a pre um, it, it's a, I don't know whether you'd regard it as a precancerous condition, but it's a condition that could potentially increase your risk of skin cancers. And it's extremely common and it's called actinic keratosis or solar keratosis or sun keratosis. So this is a hardening of the skin uh, due to sun damage. And um, this is straight from the NHS website. Um, and basically these are, um, they're not serious, they can look quite dramatic, they're quite crusty and dry, and they can be quite large and, and, and um, unpleasant looking. Um, and often if you show these to a GP, some, some of these are, can, be, can be treated with, with um, cryotherapy, with liquid nitrogen. There are different ways of treating them. Sometimes you can use creams, like infused in creams. There's different things that GPs can use to try and treat these areas, but you do need to be um, vigilant for, for these areas because these are the highest risk um, skin conditions that can progress to skin cancers and, and it says here see your GP if um, if these are new you should show them to your GP or if these lesions get bigger or start to bleed or change you should um, you should you should uh, look into them and this is um, just some cartoons that I found from the internet of just what some squamous cell carcinomas may look like they could look scaly they could look bumpy or nodular, or they could look punched out and ulcerated. And basal cell carcinomas are even more um, variable in their appearance. So some of them can be pigmented, some of them can be sort of red and eczematous looking, some of them can be crusty. So any of these skin lesions, it is worth um, asking your GP to have a look at. And now I realise that time is running on, but hopefully Nona can just give us a couple of uh, minutes just to talk us through her experience of um, skin cancer and, um, and, and her impact. Um, can you see me? Danny? Hi, can you see me? Yes, we can. Good, okay. Hi, thank you very much, Norman. That was, a, that was really, really interesting. Uh, and particularly for me, because um, I've been on hydroxycarbamide for many, many years now. And my journey started in uh, 1991. And in those days, I was actually prescribed busulfan. Um, and uh, it was great because I thought um, I had 18 months drug free. Well, I didn't really, but it was the way it was treated then. You had a dose of it, and then you had a period of not taking any medication other than an aspirin. But then I moved to hydroxycarbamide. And I think all was well. Um, I have to say, you know, looking back as a child, there wasn't much attention paid to sun cream. And I had a very much outdoor life as a child. Um, and it came home to roost really, because the first time I really noticed a lump, uh, a skin sort of scaly thing was underneath my knee of a, a strange place to find it. Um, and literally as a, I was seeing the GP about another issue, and um, I said to the GP, um, I've got this thing that just won't go away. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I ended up having it cut out um, and I still have the, the scar, the war wound to show. But what it made me realize is I really need to keep um, vigilant about my skin. Um, and I've had uh, various um, actinic, uh, care, I can never say the word, AK, um, and I have a wonderful GP and, and I am very lucky that where we live, uh, we still are able to see our GPs face to face. Um, and I've had uh, some freezing done again this year. Um, and I've had freezing done fairly regularly. And I'm very fortunate now because I'm aware of it. And I started the awareness with this thing under my knee. I really keep a check on, on new scaly lumps and bumps. But my real thing that I have had to learn is actually the dangers of the sun. And it's not just our, our face or, it, it's also I had, I, I don't know if you can see, but I had some on my hands this summer or earlier this summer. And I think one of the things that has happened, particularly this last year, last summer was a very, ghastly summer in that we were in lockdown, 
but also it was very bright. It was very sunny. And, you know, even walking out into the garden or going outdoors, the sun was there. Uh, and it came, it's come home to roost to me even recently because it's not just your body, your hands. Yesterday, I happened to be um, in the hairdresser and in there, suddenly he said, you've got a scaly lump, which again, you know, probably I'd been outside without proper covering on my head, which is fine because it's, it, it'll be frozen off. But I think even be vigilant about your hair, what's going on um, on your head. And I've learned that uh, the most important thing are, the, uh, are to keep one's skin protected. You know, in the old days, it used to be thought that, you know, as, as fair skinned um, Europeans, we could be deemed to be pasty faced, I think was the answer in the winter. And so it was always, people thought, you know, they looked and felt better if they had a slight glow to their skin. And I think, I mean, I know my own mother was a great sun worshipper, but she didn't have an MPN, so she got away with it. But for me, this freezing has, you know, I, I've become so aware and I'm not going to show the actual brand, but search for factor 70 and above. Um, this also, the, the original full factor sun, sun screens made one look like a snowman. They were kind of very white, but they have evolved now and you can get high factor um, sunscreen, but I also combine it. I put, I screen, get sunscreen on my face, my arms, my hands, but you can also get a kind of natural glow, fake tan that I put on top of it. So I don't look as if I'm sort of the abominable snowman <laughs> and can look quite healthy. Um, the other thing, my top tip, is it's surprising actually how suddenly the sun can come out and you're not with a hat on or not with um, any sun sunscreen on you is this little thing now I don't know if you can see it this little thing is a stick and literally it's seven factor 75 and if I'm out in the sun my vulnerable bit is here where I've had um, some lesions removed and so literally out it comes and I swipe across and the other place that's very vulnerable is the nose. So I don't know why, but so out comes this little stick to um, protect myself from the sun. Um, I, think, I think all I can say to everybody is um, just be vigilant, wear a hat. Um, Mad Dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun, that wonderful song by um, Noel Coward, a hat, a hat. Um, and um, so I think I've now got a selection of hats uh, that I just grab, uh, whether it be a baseball cap or whatever, just to make sure that I don't subject myself to any more sun damage than I've already had. I think, I think, Norman, that's really all I can say. I don't know if you've got any questions for me. No, I think you've covered it. You've covered it absolutely perfectly, and I like um, exactly you've, you've you know, covered it beautifully. Um, is 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 be aware of the sun. So that's so. In fact, I realise that we're running out of time. So I'm going to just I'm just get to the next slide. So it's just to summarise all exactly as you've you've said. So basically, I want to put I, the reason I think it's important to just um, to put um, the risk of MPNs and second cancers on people's radar, but trying to put it in context. Um, it is not something that you need to be overly concerned about compared to the general population, but clinicians and patients should be aware of that. But I do want to labour skin cancers because we've seen some, some fairly unpleasant skin cancers, um, particularly with, with roxolitinib use um, uh, in patients at, at, at Clatterbridge. So that's why that is probably the, the reason why I wanted to, 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 to highlight this talk uh, today. Particularly, and that's why on treatments for for um, for MPN, so patients on hydroxy, particularly in our hands, uh, roxolitinib patients and non-melanoma skin cancer, I want you to be, be particularly careful. And then, as Nona has said, um, is skin protection is is the message in this in this talk. It can all be summarised on that. So, use high factor sunscreen. Definitely avoid sunburn. 
And then the guidance says, skin, do self-surveillance. And I recommend self-surveillance. Just watch for any new lesions that look odd, particularly if you've got a history of sun damage, solar keratosis or actinic keratosis, or if you have a history of previous skin cancer. And if you're on these agents, skin self-surveillance is really important. However, we are now looking at um, a formal dermatology skin surveillance for a selective group of patients. So if you have very, very extensive actinic keratosis, so so many lesions that potentially any one of these could, could, could uh, potentially change. So if you're very extensive, or um, if you've got a previous history of skin cancer, and we put you on roxolitinib, I think that there has been an offer from dermatology to screen our patients like they screen um, 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 solid organ transplant patients, renal transplant patients, and liver transplant patients. They screen them because the risk of skin cancer in them for immune suppression is high. So we're looking at moving in that direction for roxolitinib patients. Um, so that's all I wanted to say uh, on that topic. So I'll hand back now to Nona as chair. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, um, Dr. Buck. This has been really informative and I'm sure um, will be of interest to everybody watching. Now, our next speaker is Dr. Arvind Pillay, um, and he's going to talk to us about interferon in MPNs, ET and PV. Um, welcome, Arvind, and thank you for, for coming today. So no, no, you can see my slide and hear me okay? <clears throat> yes, we can. Perfect. So my name is Arvind Pillai. I'm one of the hematologists based at uh, Chester. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be part of this forum. Uh, my role is to discuss interferon in myeloproliferative neoplasms in particular ET and PV. So these are the abbreviations I'll use in my talk. And this is the structure of my talk. After giving you an introduction to interferon, we'll discuss some trial data, and we'll also touch on some future concepts. So what is interferon? Interferon is a naturally occurring protein that is produced by our immune system to help fight viruses, bacteria, and cancer. It was discovered more than 50 years ago. There are three types, alpha, beta, and gamma. And it's a man-made copy of the naturally occurring interferon used to treat MPN and other conditions as well. So there are several different types of interferon which are made by several different drug companies under several different brand names. We have the short acting ones used several times a week and the long acting ones used once a week or less often. The most common one you would have heard of is Pegasus, which is a pegylated interferon alpha 2A. So there is some advantage of side effects when you use long-term, uh, sorry, long-acting interferon, but this has not been proven in clinical studies. Interferon is a drug given uh, as an injection just under the skin. We also now have the newer uh, innovative next generation monopegulated interferon alpha 2b, which is called ROPEG interferon. This has been through phase three clinical trials. And I'll be discussing some trial data in my next few slides. So how does interferon work? It's not completely understood in MPN. It has an effect on the white cells and the red cell stem cells, and it suppresses its production. It stimulates our immune system and enhances the immune system response. So when is it used in MPN? In patients less than 40 years of age with ET, PV, or MF. In selected patients less than 60 years of age. It's a safe and effective option in pregnancy or patients trying to conceive, both male and female. And in patients who are intolerant or have poor response to hydroxycarbamide or other drugs. So moving on to some trial data on pegylated interferon in ET and PV. So Pegasus is an, uh, a, a pegylated interferon alpha 2A, which has been to two phase two clinical trials. It has shown a complete hematological response of 94 and 80% and a complete molecular response of six and 24%. So complete hematological response is a normalization of your blood count. 
and a complete molecular response is an undetectable JAK2 mutation. Regulated interferon alpha 2b has been through two, uh, sorry, four phase two clinical trials and has shown a slightly lesser hematological and molecular response. So phase two clinical trials are essentially trials designed to help us find out more about the side effects and to look at how well the treatment works. So what about phase three trials? The only published randomized phase three trial for interferon in PV patients we have is for ROPEG interferon. So phase three trials are larger clinical trials comparing new treatment to standard uh, once safety concerns have been addressed in uh, earlier phases. So the trial is called a PROUD PV trial and it compares ROPEG interferon to hydroxycarbamide in both treatment naive patients and in, whom, uh, and in patients who have been on hydroxycarbamide for less than three years and are not responding well. After 12 months, the patients have the option to enter the extension part of the trial that's called the continuation PV trial. So we have the five-year data published very recently, which I'll be discussing in my next few slides. Just to mention here that in the best available treatment arm, 88% of patients were on hydroxycarbamide. So it's a more or less a head-to-head -head comparison between ROPEG interferon and, um, and hydroxycarbamide. So the trial's primary objective is to look at long-term efficacy of ROPEG interferon in maintaining hematological response and also changes to the disease burden, in, uh, mainly splenomegaly, uh, microvascular disturbances, and pruritus. The secondary objectives are to look at the long-term safety, quality, and jack 2 allele burden. These are the baseline characteristic of patients. There are a couple of things I would like to mention here. Firstly, uh, we have an equal number of female and male patients. The median age group of these patients are around 58 years. So you can see in the um, slide that the oldest patient is 85 years of age. I have one patient who is 86 and has been on interferon for, pegylated interferon for 10 years now. He takes 135 micrograms every two months and is doing well on treatment. I had to stop his interferon, uh, sorry, his hydroxycarbamide because he developed severe leg ulcerations. So this slide demonstrates that although patients have a similar hematological response at one year, with continuation of treatment, significantly more patients will maintain their complete hematological response on ROPEG interferon when you compare it to hydroxycarbamide. Here we see that with long-term treatment with ROPEG interferon, um, your JAK2 allele burden decreases substantially as well. So what about thromboembolic events? You can see here that um, there is a similar number of patients having thromboembolic events in both arms. With regards to disease progression, we have only one patient in the ROPEG interferon arm who developed myelofibrosis compared to four patients in the uh, control arm, that's the hydroxycarbamide arm, who developed uh, two developed myelofibrosis and two developed acute leukemia. So what inter, what, so for, for, for adverse drug reactions, we see that the most common side effect is uh, thyroid-related problems in 5% of patients and psychiatric issues like depression, anxiety in 1% of the patients. In terms of skin toxicity, here we see that 3% of patients in the control arm had skin-related cancers, and there is none in the ROPEG interferon arm. So to conclude, at if you uh, patients who continued on ROPEG interferon uh, at five years were significantly more likely to be phlebotomy independent compared to best available therapy. So in the best available therapy, as I mentioned, 88% patients were on the hydroxycarbamide. It effectively controlled hematocrit, minimized thromboembolic events. Disease progression was rare during long-term treatment, and we are not seeing any new safe segments. Hello, you're right. Yes. We'll be back in 20. We're Sorry, carry on. Sorry. Um, so MPD RC1112 is the only other unpublished phase three trial which compares pegylated interferon to hydroxycarbamide in PV and ET. 
it has shown a similar efficacy to hydroxycarbamide in terms of hematological response. So moving on to practical steps in initiating pegylated interferon and, and monitoring. So these are the tests I do before starting treatment and then every four to six monthly. The most notable one here is the thyroid function test. I must also mention that I uh, do an eye test on every patient before uh, they start interferon, which includes a fundoscopy examination. A fundoscopy examination is looking at the back of the eye, that is the retina, where uh, problems due to interferon have been uh, reported on rare occasions. So what about dosing? I start my patients on 90 micrograms every week, and then I titrate depending on hematological response and side effects. I'll skip this. The most common uh, symptom we see here are flu-like illness in 50% of the patients. Most patients will develop flu-like illness when they start treatment, but I see that these symptoms get better with time. This does not also have an impact on their uh, daily uh, activities of living. I encourage patients to use either paracetamol or, uh, or brufen 24 to 48 hours before starting treatment and to continue it for 24 to 48 hours after that. Non-pharmacological approaches like having a cold shower or a bath or even changing the site of, sorry, the timing of their injection and even applying some uh, cold, uh, 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 just cooling the area where you, uh, you have your injections helps symptoms as well. A couple of things to mention here in terms of side effect, which I've already addressed before is thyroid related disorders and also psychiatric issues in around 1% of patients. So in my last few slides, we'll discuss some future concepts and we'll also, uh, I'll also summarize. So in France, around 25 to 30% of their patients will have a treatment holiday from, from interferon. So this has been presented uh, very recently. It's not published yet. This approach is feasible if you are in a complete hematological response for two years and have a low JAK2 allele burden of less than 10%. At relapse after discontinuation, restarting interferon also seems effective with no development of resistance. So in 2017, a patient of mine with PV had presented at this forum on discontinuing interferon. She still remains offered treatment. The interferon was discontinued because she developed side effects with it. And this is not something I do in my day-to-day -day practice. Of note, we also have patients who have chronic myeloid leukemia who stop their treatment once they go into a complete molecular response. So I think this approach still seems feasible in a selected group of patients. Some experts say that low dose maintenance may be the way forward. But before we advise any such approaches, this all has to go through clinical trials for us to validate any such approach. So what about use of interferon in low-risk PV patients? So low-risk PV patients are patients who are less than 60 years of age and who haven't had a thrombotic event. There were two papers published this year. One is an American study of 470 patients. So it was a retrospective data analysis over 10 years. And it has shown an improvement in myelofibrosis-free survival in low-risk PV compared to hydroxycarbamide of lobotomy alone. The second was an Italian paper on 217 patients over one year, which has shown that adding ROPEG interferon to phlebotomy in low-risk PV patients was superior in maintaining hematocrit values. Whether this will have any meaningful uh, uh, data in terms of uh, disease progression, we'll have to wait and see. So to summarize, we have limited experience of interferon in, in, in the United Kingdom. There's a potential advantage as a disease modifying agent by reducing the JAK2 allele burden, marrow fibrosis, it's not leukemogenic, and even uh, and low dose maintenance or even stopping after a suitable interval is looking feasible. 
It's a good alternative for both young patients and those intolerant to hydroxycarbamide. Different patients need different dose and frequency, in my opinion, and one size doesn't uh, fit all. It has its limitations in terms of cost. It's an injectable uh, drug. Discontinuation rates are around 25%. And uh, some patients, especially with AXL1 mutations, don't respond very well to interferon. So thank you to MPN Voice for the opportunity to present today. Um, you can get some more information on the MPN Voice website. And I look forward to meeting everyone in Chester next year. I think we've already booked the venue. I can't remember the date exactly. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much, you. Dr. Pillay. And yes, we have booked the venue. And the date is something like the 23rd of September. I, I'm sure that we will, we will put it and post it on the website. Um, but we are looking forward to seeing you there too. And thank you so much for such an interesting talk. Um, I now would like to welcome Dr. Ernest Hartin, and he's going to talk to us on a very important topic at the moment, <coughs> which is COVID and MPNs. Um, welcome, welcome to, to you, Hartin. Uh, are you there? Good afternoon, everyone. Many thanks for the MPN Voice for giving me this opportunity to give this lecture and share this afternoon with you all. First of all, I would like to thank Nona, Mass, and Dani for helping us to put all these together. Let me share my slides. The topic that's been given to me is myelopolyphrodineoplasm and COVID-19. What I have done over the next 10 minutes or so is to try and put together the slides, which are more like a frequently asked questions in COVID-19. MPN patients at high risk of COVID-19. In spite of COVID-19 being with us for nearly two years or so, still too little known. What we know now is that high risk myelofibrosis patients may have a high risk of adverse outcome. COVID-19 patients are at increased risk of thrombosis. Myelopolyphrate neoplasm is a unique cancer where the goal or the aim of the treatment is to prevent thrombosis, which is different from other cancers. COVID-19 are at increased risk, gives increased risk of thrombosis, as well as MPN patients are at pre-existing risk of disease-associated thrombosis. Essential thrombocytemia patients are at higher risk of thrombotic complications. When they get infections, if there is a sharp drop in the platelet count, it was shown to be associated with worst outcome. But it's important to note, not yet we got any robust data. What are the current treatment goals during this pandemic? What I've done over the next two, three slides is to put through what we should be doing, those who hasn't got any infections or those who have, and also those who require hospitalizations. So those patients without any documented COVID-19 infections, it's very important to have strict 
adherence to treatment goals. We need to try and keep their hematocrits less than 45% in PV patients, white cell count less than 10, platelets less than 400. Any ET and PV patients who are on antiplatelet, they should be on unless there is an absolute contraindication, should continue. What about MPN patients with suspected COVID-19? They should all receive prophylactic dose of low molecular weight heparin when get admitted in the hospital. Most of the patients, or if not all of them, will get prophylactic heparin when they get hospitalized. Without a known clot or a proven clot, full anticoagulation outside the clinical trial is not advisable, even though MPN patients are at pre-existing increased risk of thrombosis. MPN patient already on warfarin or newer or oral anticoagulant like abixapan, adoxapan, dabigatran should continue. MPN patients who have a pre-COVID arterial thrombosis like heart attacks or stroke, it's important that they continue on aspirin. Should cytoreduction be adjusted to decrease the risk of COVID-19? The answer is no. No data that hydroxyurea, interferon alpha, and anagrolide increases the risk of COVID-19. It's very important, as I mentioned in my last slide, good disease control is important to avoid further thrombotic risk. During the peak of the pandemic, some of the MPN patients would have to skip their venous sections. These PV patients and in general, during this pandemic, should make sure they increase their fluid intake. Should JAK inhibitors be adjusted or stopped to decrease the risk of COVID? It's a big no. Very important that discontinuation should be avoided with all JAK2 inhibitors like paroxetinib, fedratinib, and others. Stopping may result in debilitation, progressive splenomegaly, or radley cytokine storm. If there is a clear clinical indications, then it would be better to be tapered slowly before stopping. MPN patients with COVID infection in hospital must continue hydroxyurea anagrolide or interferon, and it does not need to be adjusted or stopped. Proloxetinib, preferably to be stopped or tapered only if there is going to be any drug-to-drug -drug interactions, like some of the antivirals that you could see in the slides, or any other treatment for COVID infections that might interact. And even in those, it's better to be tapered before stopping it altogether. Should MPN patients receive COVID-19 vaccine? From day one, we have been advising patients to get vaccinated as soon as possible. Even in patients with an MPN, with a history of thrombosis should not be avoided or delayed. 
as you might be aware that there has been some report of small increase in thrombosis or clot associated with a certain type of vaccine. These are all very rare and it is important all our patients are vaccinated. And I'm pleased to know that in the recent survey that more than 90 to 95 percent of the MPN patients have received vaccines and there were very little who had any major concern. Third dose or the booster dose should be taken once offered. What about infection in general in NPN patients? Several studies, including some of the largest studies, like the Swedish study of over 3,000 patients with the MPN, showed increased risk of viral and bacterial infections compared to healthy controls. A study of around 1,000 patients with myelofibrosis on raloxetinib are also shown to have at increased risk of infections. These we know that it is due to immune dysregulations in these patients. In view of that, there was a big question about how efficacy, how effective is the vaccine in these patients? So what is the efficacy of vaccination in the MPN patients? There were only three small studies, only one with two doses of vaccine. It's very pleasing to know that ET and PV patients showed good response. The percentage varies, but it is going on around from 80% to near normal in the studies. MR patients' response was slightly less well, but the sample were too small and it is a subgroup analysis. Most important to note that all MPN patients had a better response when compared to other blood cancers like myeloma or chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Dr. Hartin, for a really, really helpful and useful, reassuring presentation about um, COVID and MPNs. Um, it's something that I know at the moment is, is causing a lot of concern still with whether you have a booster or a third vaccine, but um, your talk has been very useful to us all. Thank you very, very much. Um, we are about to go into our live panel Q&A. And um, I am asking, uh, just again, please try and avoid um, asking the clinicians personal treatment plans uh, because they won't be able to answer, answer them. They need to go back to your um, own hematologist team. Um, I'm now handing over to Dr. Butt, uh, who is going to be chairing this session, which I'm sure will be a lively session. Uh, do keep your questions coming in through the chat. Uh, and we will try and answer as many as we can live today. Thank you, Norman. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, Nona. So um, we had some questions submitted um, beforehand, um, um, but some of these questions will have already been addressed by the talk. So I will come to some of those pre-submitted questions if things dry up um, uh, as we go along, but we've had some live chat questions that we'll try and answer. And I'm just going to nominate uh, my colleagues on the panel to um, answer some of these. So uh, the first, my colleague beside me then, one of the questions um, that was asked is about sun exposure and is 15 minutes in the sun okay just to top up vitamin D levels? So um, Rachel, do you want to take that? So we just had a bit of a disagreement about this because um, 
obviously no one was an immediate response was of course it is which of course it is but obviously not in the uh, the beating down sun if you're in dubai 15 minutes is obviously not okay so i think ultimately it depends on how hot it is out there and what we're suggesting that you do is actually avoid any skin damage and obviously 15 minutes in very very hot sun can still cause some damage so i think it's still about erring on side of caution but not being um, you know, panicked if you know the sun just happens to come out on a on a day like today. I think it's about being sensible and um, um, and you know and 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 using the suggestions that um, uh, Nona was talking about with you know keeping hats handy and keeping sun you know protection you know on on you wherever possible, um, but uh, but not getting panicked is what I would say. I don't know whether anybody wants to add to that. Okay, so um, the other thing then, we'll, we'll, we'll stick on the theme of skin. There's one more um, question, with several questions on skin, which we'll come to, but the one is about um, length of time on exposure on hydroxycarbamide and the risk of skin cancer. Do you want to sorry. speak? Sorry, the length of time on exposure with hydroxycarbamide and the risk of skin cancer. Is it time dependent, the amount of exposure you've had? Well, I think we were talking about this and we were saying that we, uh, we don't actually know the, the sort of full statistics about this, but I think that, um, you know, the feeling is probably the, it, it probably is, but I don't actually know any sort of specific sort of data on that, so I can't, um, I can only say that it seems logical that the longer you're on a drug, if it carries a side effect, then you probably do have sort of, you know, the risk is always going to be there, and the longer you're on it, then you probably do have an increased risk, but it comes back to, again, being sensible about, you know, preventing um, you know, skin damage and just being vigilant about checking your skin carefully and, and letting us know if you've got any concerns when you come to see us in clinic. Um, so as I say, I'm sorry, I haven't got any statistics sort of available. I don't know whether no. you do. No, no, I think, I think, I think that's, that's the best kind of answer I could give, which is that, you know, you imagine that it's not so much that it's a cumulative risk, it's just that that risk remains for every year you're on it. So the drug carries a, a slight increased risk of skin cancer. So every year you're on it, that you carry that risk. So if you're on it for 50 years versus 10 years, well, it's, you've, you've got five times the exposure and therefore five times the, 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 the potential, I guess, uh, period where you are at risk. Um, and in fact, even the SBC says when you discontinue the drug, you should continue to monitor your skin. So yes, I think there probably is a length of time exposure risk. Um, so um, one more question on skin, which is just a comment, is something about darkening, if patches of darkening skin, um, are these risk factors for skin cancer? Not that I'm aware of, but any, but the, these drugs are mainly associated with non-melanoma skin cancer. So if you have a pigmented lesion, not necessarily just a patch area of dark skin, but if you have a pigmented mole or something that, that starts to bleed or grows or has irregular edges, then please do get that seen from them, um, uh, seen by your GP. Okay, some um, some questions. So please keep the questions coming in the chat. But there's a question which um, um, I'll put to um, uh, Dr. Peely. There's been a question submitted asking if it's okay for patients with PV to have HRT. Sorry, I'm not sharing my video because there are bandwidth issues in rural Cheshire. Um, but to answer that. Can you hear me okay, Norman? Um, so I'm assuming that this patient has no other risk factors. Um, so basically HRT has a lower dose of estrogen in it compared to an oral contraceptive pill. Um, there's only one published study on ET which does not suggest HRT increases thrombotic risk, but OCP actually does if you take other risk, other risk factors have to be taken into consideration, but HRT with a low dose of est estrogen is acceptable in, in my opinion. Okay, thank you for that, um, uh, Arvind. Okay, there's, um, we're expecting, there's quite a few questions pre-submitted on COVID, but there's one that's just come through, which I am um, hopefully heartened may be able to answer, which is, um, are you advising ET patients post third dose of vaccine to keep semi shielding? Martin, do you want to take that? Okay. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? 
okay, you know, like with the with the you know any vaccines, we have to just go, you know, with the COVID the risk and shielding. It's it's more to do with not just with that and with the community as well. So a lot of the government advice has to be taken into considerations because the government advice is not just the individual. They take into account the the risk that's involved in the community. So obviously, the more risk. You know the higher in the peak of the pandemic you know it, you have to be much more con cautious compared when the risks are low but as of now you know as and when vaccinated after you know even after the second covid vaccine you know we are, we are allowed to sort of uh, you know re uh, relax as much as we can but at the same time it's important the other risk factors taken into account it's not just the ets and the third vaccines um, it's, you know, the how old are you and you have whether patients have other comorbid conditions like diabetes, hypertension and other risk factors, everything. But there isn't anything recommended as of now for a very strict shielding once you had your third vaccine. Thanks, Harton. Yeah, I think, I mean, the whole idea of shielding as such ended for everybody, um, you know, last autumn, like shielding as such ended. But that doesn't mean that we don't... Um, that we don't practice good um, social distancing and all the usual measures to protect yourself. But the whole, the actual terminology of shielding, which is to stay indoors and not to, uh, you know, to minimise your contact with with people, as 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 stipulated by the government, shielding itself has uh, has gone. So if we mean by the concept of semi shielding, um, I think it's about just minimising your risk to to crowds and, and exposure to. To, um, to risk. And, and also, sorry, just to put in, you know, just in terms of advising patients who are working, they're asking about going back to work or whether to work from home. I think, again, it, we take that on a, a case by case basis. And I think we would support those. And we, again, it comes back to being sensible and being aware of the fact that, unfortunately, the rest of the population generally does seem to have discarded masks and discarded, you know, almost thinking that the pandemic doesn't exist. And I know that we feel this is happening around us, but I, and I, you know, and therefore it's quite scary for patients who are, you know, clinically vulnerable. And um, so I think it's, you know, we can talk to you about that in clinics and 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 just that being sensible and we can support. I, you know, I know I've certainly had you know, discussions with certain patients where I've supported them with HR, where obviously they are expected to come out of shielding and work in the office. But I think we have to be sensible and try to um, you know, limit their, their you know, contact with um, all these cases, because we know the number of cases in the UK at the moment are still on the rise and it's pretty scary out there, actually. Can I just add something as well, please, Norman? Of course. So, so there's a very good section on the MPN Voice website regarding COVID and day-to-day -day life. And uh, what it does nicely, it grades different activities and shows how much risk is involved with each activity. So it's a very nicely written six page uh, document. So if you go on to that uh, um, and, and just have a look before you uh, take any activity, you, you just have some peace of mind um, going into it. Uh, there's another small document on blood cancer website as well coping with the uh, risk and uncertainty uncertainties in with COVID. So that's another document you can all look into, uh, which I found very useful uh, when talking to my patients. Thanks. That's brilliant. Thank you for signposting that. And I think that is, we are directing all our patients to MPN Voice. And, you know, um, and I'm even getting information from MPN Voice today, which I, uh, we, we can touch on uh, about when offered the third, um, vaccine so you know i mean even i'm using mpn voice as my uh, as my um, resource for keeping um, keeping up to date um i'm going to come back to i'm going to come back to um to covid i don't, I don't want to be all covid um, so i'm going to come back to covid but let's just take a break from covid for a second and um do you want to talk about do you have to talk about um Fatigue. fatigue. So, so basically, right, so, so someone's posted a question on fatigue, saying fatigue affects 80% of patients. Is that uh, a function of the condition or is that a function of treatment? I know Dr. Wells and fatigue and tiredness and the, dis and the differences in those, she's, she's, she's quite adept in trying to sort of unpick this. So I'll let her talk about that. I wouldn't say adept. I think it's, a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, such a, a, you know, it's a, a big topic because obviously fatigue is such a, 
um, a wide symptom and it's such a main symptom for everybody. And I think that you know, the answer to that question, I don't think we can really say. I think it's probably a combination of both. We know that the, um, the minor proliferative neoplasms um, as diseases do contribute to fatigue. And we know that patients who have them from, you know, young patients get very frustrated because they're expected to you know, run around and do all the childcare, for example, and, and jobs and things, and they have, get very fatigued. And we know that the, you know, they're often just on aspirin. So we know those patients get very fatigued, but equally patients on um, hydroxycarbonide, you know, Pegasus, and interferon, um, roxlitinib for the myelofibrosis patients, um, they get very fatigued. And obviously the myelofibrosis patients are often very anemic as well, and that will also cause some of the fatigue. So I think it's, it's, there's a lot of reasons why people can be very fatigued. It's very difficult to unpick it. And again, all we can do is listen to you when you come to clinic and see whether there's things that we can help. You know, and again, it sort of comes back to if you are working, whether or not things can be altered in your work and works you know, in your workplace to see whether that, that you know that can be helped so it's you know other than optimizing your you know, your disease itself um, you know it's very very difficult to know what we can do about it and I think we always tend to say and I know that certain patients who will have been to uh, patients who have been to other forums will have listened to um, some patients talk about fatigue incredibly eloquently and um, you know it's very clear that you know you, it's something you can't push through it's not like a tiredness it's very different it's something that you you hit a brick wall and it's people talk about walking through mud and and it's very very you know it, it's, it's it's very debilitating and I think it's just recognizing the fact that you're not alone and to again talk about these symptoms and see whether there's anything you can do day to day to help I don't know whether anybody can add anything on that in terms of their experiences. Can can is this Steph? Steph's there. Steph, you must get a lot of um, a lot of questions on managing fatigue in patients. It's always very helpful to have. So we're very lucky to have Steph um, join us. And Steph, how do you um, how do you kind of um, manage uh, when patients complain of fatigue? How do you how do you go about advising them to manage their fatigue? Um, I had um, a conversation with a patient recently and I actually again signposted them to MPN Voice because they do quite a good um, leaflet on coping with fatigue. Um, it's, it's, all, it's about listening to your body. Um, I think everyone knows what their body feels like um, and it, it's not, not forcing yourself to do things but at the same time you've still got to do things because the less you do with fatigue the more fatigue you'll actually feel. Um, so I recommend doing fatigue diaries, finding out when the best time of the day is and making advantage of that, making sure that they're eating well, drinking well, um, making sure that they're not having too much caffeine before they go to bed, because obviously a good night's sleep can help with fatigue. So it's just I usually throw it back to the patient and say, what is what does their day look like? And then we talk about what they could be doing more, or what they could be doing less and just you know, because it's so individual, somewhat one person's fatigue can be completely different to someone else's fatigue. So I don't have a one, you know, one rule fits everyone. It's just speaking to the patient, asking what they do, and then trying to work with them and just saying, okay, let's look at how, you know, how you can improve your, your activities and things. But I'd certainly say the less you do, the more fatigued you'll, you will be, but it's getting that balance um, with not overdoing it, but not underdoing it as well. Excellent. That's that's really helpful. Now, while we've got you and you've got you've loosened up your vocal cords, I'll give you another question. If that's all right, it came in. You may have seen it in the pre-submitted question, and it's about um, it's about patients and their appetite, early satiety, and fullness. Um, and they're basically asking about any dietary requirements to manage their MF. I, don't, I, I presume what the I presume I'm reading into the question, but I presume this is a myelofibrosis patient with splenomegaly and therefore finding it difficult to maintain their nutritional kind of balance because of because of uh, because of their spleen so what kind of advice do you give patients who've got a very big spleen and and uh, fill up very quickly um it, it tends to be um small small meals little and often also eating what you feel like eating because um if you don't feel like eating it, you don't fancy it, that's not going to help your appetite. But I'd certainly say small, small meals and often not heavy meals, meals that are actually easy to eat as well. If you're having to chew, you know, steaks or I'm vegetarian, so I'm a bit biased. But if you have to um, eat steaks and it takes a lot of energy to chew things, 
then take things that are sort of like shepherd's pie, you know, things that are, are, are easy to digest and not heavy and don't, are just not going to overface you. So really little and often. And dietitian um, is also good. If you do feel that you're losing a lot of weight and you're not getting your nutrition in, speak to your, your specialist nurse um, and ask to be referred to the dietitian as well because their input is invaluable as well. Excellent advice. Excellent advice, little and often. And uh, yeah, calorie re replacement as well. Um, um, because I think people tend to rush to, to want nutritional supplements and drinks. And actually, as you say, it's about making their own dietary modifications first before, before doing that. Okay, we're going to jump back into uh, COVID, just giving Harton a wee bit of a break, but we're going to jump back in. Harton, can you there's, there's been a lot of confusion in clinic when I have patients getting very confused between uh, the, all the kind of terminologies around a third dose and a booster dose. Um, and what's the difference between a third and a booster? And is my third my booster? Can you just kind of demist, try and simplify it? If pretty much everyone on here will have had two vaccines. Please demystify the third vaccine and the booster okay. vaccine for the for Okay, for sort of a UK patients, you know, it's pretty straightforward in the sense like uh, uh, what we are going to get is a Pfizer vaccine uh, that is uh, is uh, is pretty much the third vac vaccine. So it comes in, it comes this booster uh, comes into the dosage. So Moderna type, um, you know, companies doing the vaccines where their booster is half a dose and the third vaccine is the full dose. As of now here, um, we are all getting the Pfizer, which is pretty much can be termed as a, as a, as a third vaccine. And that's, that's, and that's how it is now. It's as simple as that. That's another vaccine, Pfizer, uh, and it is the same dose, whether it's called a third or booster, because it is a full dose. Yeah, exactly. So I think that, that I think the view is that um, after having had your two primary vaccinations, anyone with a hematological cancer, they are they are suspected of having maybe a, a less than perfect immune response. So they're being advised that, that their third vaccine is a third primary vaccine. So in other words, the general population, two vaccines is enough to get the best response, but they're assuming that all blood cancer patients are equal and therefore they all have a slightly reduced response to those first two. So the third one is a third primary vaccine to get you up to everybody else's levels. And then there is talk of a fourth vaccine in six months, but, but please don't go to your GP and ask for that fourth vaccine. I've had a patient actually approach their GP wanting that fourth vaccine booked now that's not available that will come in the spring and a decision will be made on that and I see someone's put in the chat box which is really helpful which is something that I literally found out today and this is um, you know so it shows that you know I'm trying to keep as much up to date as I possibly can but I'm grateful that someone uh, in the audience has put in the chat box about um, the specific advice about the Moderna vaccine which I did not know and they say it's been out for a couple of weeks so um, Harton do you want to do you want to just explain that the the issue around the Moderna it's to do you, we were discussing it earlier it's to do with the fact that Moderna um, doses yeah. are, are booster doses yeah so the, 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 the in, only in the Moderna vaccine that it is it's there is a clear differentiation between a booster and uh, and the third vaccines so in Moderna, the booster means they will be giving half the dose. And if it is a full vaccine, it will be called third vaccine. It is the full dose. So that is the difference. It doesn't matter with the Pfizer. So it is the Moderna one, which is the difference. Uh, it's the half and the full dose. <clears throat> and so with the third vaccine, we, if it is a vaccine, if it is a third vaccine, then even with the Moderna, it should be the full dose. And I think the, the, the information is actually on MPN Voice. It's very clearly laid out that if, you know, if you are offered um, for your third vaccine, you, know, you, have, you can ask and check that it is the Pfizer vaccine that you're actually receiving. Okay, so I didn't even know that. So, um, and even yesterday in clinic, I was telling patients based on the Blood Cancer UK information, which was when you get offered your third vaccine, 
take whatever you're given. Just take what they've got. Thankfully, Moderna as a third vaccine is not in wide circulation, I'm told. So thankfully, my advice as of yesterday didn't really have any clinical impact, but it just shows it is such a rapidly moving field. And I mean, I work almost exclusively in MPN and CML, and even I, I am struggling to keep up with the changing uh, field. Um, I'll take a question now because um, to do with MPN and cancer and one of um, a very shrewd eyed member of the audience uh, saw from the table that I presented where I was showing some of the, the skin cancer incidences. Um, where I quoted about a 25 of, of patients, so it's not you have a 25% risk of skin cancer, is in that small group of MPN patients that will get, get a, a other, another cancer, 25% uh, of them will be a skin cancer. The, the, um, somebody noticed that the prostate cancer uh, risk was actually very similar to the skin cancer risk. Um, now, what I'd say is that what the data I showed you was from a, an MPN expert, but it, um, in Italy, uh, a chap called Barbui in Italy, and it's a multi-center Italian um, study of a cohort of patients. Um, but it's a it is so it's but it's one country. It's one country, multiple centers, but one country. Um, and so yes, the numbers are very similar for prostate cancer. Um, so it must be, if it's similar to the skin cancer, it must be something in the region of 20% uh, risk. That does not mean MPN patients have a 20% risk of prostate cancer. It means if you have a cancer, out of the 100 cancers you may get, 20 of them will be prostate, 20 of them will be skin, and then you know 80% will be weird and wonderful others. But that doesn't mean that I want everybody to go out and get PSAs done in prostate screening, but it just means you have to be vigilant for prostate symptoms if you are an MPN patient. And if you have prostate symptoms, you should have them checked out. But whether you're an MPN patient or otherwise, you should have your prostate symptoms checked out. So yes, shrewdly spotted, very, very impressed. Um, but again, please put all of this into perspective. Um, it is not something that I, wa I want you to be aware of it, but I don't want you to worry about it. Okay, um, now we're getting into some of the some of the, some somewhat harder uh, questions to answer. So I'm going to pass one on to um, Arvind. I don't know if you feel happy to take one, but there's a question that's just come on about um, easing uh, night sweats um, that are affecting sleep. So if you've got an MPN patient with with night sweats that are interfering with their sleep. How would you how would you address that if you're seeing this patient in clinic? I mean, it's a, it's a difficult question. I suppose the question is uh, what uh, MPN the patient has, uh, um, and is there is there any way I can know? So, 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 say if it's if so, so, you just, see just, nice just, so, so it's we're not going to deal with a specific patient's MPN. It's just yes. it, it, a patient with an MPN comes to you in clinic, say, mm -hmm. whichever one, because it, it, you can see night sweats were reported across across. So I suppose if if, if this. That's right. If they are an ET or PV patients and uh, they are getting increased amount of night sweats, one of the things I would consider is whether there is disease progression. So that is something to consider in, in this setting. Um, uh, uh, I mean, in terms of managing symptoms, I suppose if you have better disease control, then your symptoms are much better because if you're, I suppose if your jack to allele burden is lesser, maybe your symptoms are better. Um, and is there anything that can ease night sweats? Uh, that's a difficult one um, um, because I think it's impacting their sleep and I think they're getting more fatigued as well as a result of it. But it, it's, it's not easy to, to manage night sweats as such is, is how I see it. No, exactly. I think, I mean, I think exactly, I think you've signposted, which is you've got, I, this is how I view it, which is exactly what you've said, which is if someone's describing worsening night sets interfering with their disease, then I'd be worrying about the background impact of what's going on with their background disease. Um, um, but yes, um, so it'd be correlating it with their disease and then seeing if it's optimally controlled. Um, again, Arvind, while you're speaking, there's been a question you, you, you talked on, on interferons. There's a question on, um, on pegylated interferon. Is having inflammatory bowel disease, you know, an inflammatory disease such as sarcoid a contraindication to having peg? Throwing, throwing all, all the difficult, difficult ones. <laughs> the difficult questions, exactly. I'm glad, I'm glad okay. you've got 
Um, I mean, that's a very specific question. I, I, I must say that I'm, I don't know the answer to that, but it, on looking at it, I don't think there is a de definite contraindication because we don't screen for sarcoidosis or anything as such when we start, uh, uh, you know, we don't worry too much about it. So I, I, I don't think there is an absolute contraindication is what I think. I don't know if anyone else could chip into it. Okay. Um, there's been some um, there's been some talk on uh, I mean there's one question on 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 aspirin things there's some research in the news this week about the efficacy of aspirin as a blood thinner are there any viable alternatives but Harton apparently you and Rachel were having a little discussion about aspirin um, and recent sort of information it may not specifically answer that question but do you just want to just talk about um, uh, antiplatelet therapy aspirin in particular and and um, um, <laughs> You know, there was about a couple of um, days ago, uh, there was a uh, uh, um, report from the US basically regarding the, uh, you know, uh, taking aspirin for um, prevention of the, you know, stroke. So they did the analysis and they're going to put a report through in saying like, uh, in the, you know, the patients who are older than 60 uh, who has got no pre-risk, you know, no other risk factors, um, and never had previous uh, clot problems in, you know, any strokes or heart attacks. Uh, they were debating whether, uh, you know, uh, taking a regular aspirin is, is uh, 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 you know, is in their best interest, or is it producing more, more harm than good. Uh, it's, it, so it's important that to, all our patients, you know, ETPV patients, um, are on aspirin as a pre prevention factor. You, you, you know, uh, we all know or should know by now that, uh, you know, the goal and the aim of the treatment in ET and PV is to prevent thrombosis. So these patients are all at the predisposing, you know, risk factor to have uh, clot problems, and the main aim is to prevent. So clearly all of them, you know, unless there is an absolute contraindication should be on aspirin unless further trials or any details comes comes through. So if we need to be very clear here, this report which has come out in US two days ago is only for those patients who doesn't have any predisposing or never had any uh, heart attacks or stroke before. That's great. Thank you for that. That's quite comprehensive. Um, okay. Um, um, I'm going to take a really easy one, really easy one, because it's a cop out, which says, can my children inherit PV? So um, I'll take that easy one. No, they can't pass on PV. But what I would say just sort of to, is that these conditions, they are not hereditary. You don't pass them on, but these conditions potentially can run in families. And that's um, some of these things were mentioned by Nona in the introduction, there's a trial called the Mosaic trial, looking at the sort of epidemiology of, um, of MPN. So, you know, in terms of what, what environmental and social factors may have played a part, or are they seeing any trends in these patients? Um, um, and, uh, and so whilst no, you cannot pass on your PV in any of these, these mutations that you have, people think it's genetic and therefore it's hereditary. Um, these are acquired genetic, you develop them in your lifetime and therefore they're not, um, they're not inherited ones that you get from your family or you can pass on. Um, I think I'll just, uh, we still got another couple of minutes before the official um, end to, um, the the um, another comfort break before we go into the breakout session um there is uh, do you want to take that one no okay right okay right i'll, I'll think about that one in a second there's one right okay so there's a okay so there's one um if i can if i can maybe get um steph again steph would you be able to again it's not an easy one um you seem to be getting some of the trickier ones but there's a patient that's saying they're not clear about the about what bone pain actually feels like so and it is on the mpn 10 so bone pain is on that 
Um, so people are expected to score. And in the same way as people ask me, how do you score fever on an MPN 10? And I can, and I agree, some of these questions on the MPN 10 are really difficult to answer. But clearly, bone pain's on the MPN 10. Your patients are going to want to score it. So how would you how would you advise uh, the patients uh, on their on, on scoring for bone pain? Okay. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, again, it's up to the individual because one person's pain can be so different to someone else's pain. So exactly what bone pain is, I would say it's a constant pain that I think we've already mentioned that it's not joint pain. So if you think of your joints being your, your wrist, your elbows, your shoulder, I'm pointing out as if you don't know where they are, but anyway, your hips, your knees and your ankles. So if you think about this part of your bone, your long bones. So if you're getting bone pain here or in your back or on your legs, I think if you had bone pain, you would know it is bone pain because it's it, it's a very uncomfortable pain. It's a very niggly pain. Um, and I think with regard to scoring it, it it's, it's what you think it is. I mean, if 10 is that you can't cope with it and you need to take painkillers, someone might say that's a 10 or someone might say well I can take painkillers and then the pain goes and therefore it's a five so I think the whole thing with scoring it's it's your score it's not someone else's score and you you have to as long as you can explain the whole idea of the score is so that you can explain to your clinician these are my symptoms and these is how it's affecting me so I wouldn't be too worried about whether it's a six or is it an eight because it's just you saying to your clinician, last time I spoke to you, my pain was a six, but actually now it's a nine. And, you know, why is that? And it's just a good way of, you know, explaining that my score has gone up and why has my score gone up? Or sometimes, why has my score gone down? It was a nine. And, you know, and I was on lots of um, analgesia, but now actually I've reduced the amount of analgesia I, am, I was on and my pain is better. And so why is that? And that might be because your disease is, is more controlled. So I wouldn't be too worried about, you know, should this be an eight or should this be a six? It is purely on what you think it is. And it's just to help you as a tool just to be able to explain to your clinician, this is what's happening today compared to last month or even last year. And it's just a good way of showing what what's happening with your disease. I don't think I really answered what bone pain is, but no, no, I think no, 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 I think you did. When I think, I think the the main no, I think you, you answered it perfectly, which is that um, a lot of patients um, confuse or can and fully understandably uh, the difference between joint pains and bone pains. And we're not asking about your right, you know, your arthritis of your hip that's causing you, you know, the, that's stopping you from dancing. It's a different pain. It's not a so. No, I think you've answered that perfectly. And the fact that it is specific to you in that, you know, yes, clinical trials score everybody's um, symptoms in an MPN 10 and, 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 and try and somehow find trends. It, from a clinical point of view for us, on a day-to-day -day basis, it's about exactly, as you say, identifying the patient who's finding their scores are going up and changing for them. So I think, no, I think you've answered it perfectly. Um, I'm going to give, I, I think, um, I'm just watching now about the time. So I might just take one or two more questions, but one um, which I'll, which um, Arvind, you keep, keep getting the difficult ones. It's another difficult one. Um, is uh, Again, we've got to be very careful about addressing specific, but it's a specific, there's a specific question from a specific patient about their medication, but it's a, in principle, should a PV patient, um, we're talking about antiplatelet therapy, but, it, um, but, um, it's it's if they're on antiplatelet if they're on anticoagulation do they come off anticoagulation and take antiplatelet therapy or are you quite happy that they are um, that 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 they just stay on anticoagulation? So this question is for me, yeah. For no yeah, if that's okay. I mean, there would be a specific indication why this patient is on apixaban. So, um, you know, I would not recommend that uh, they, they they come off apixaban and go on aspirin. They should stay on apixaban. Because um, aspirin doesn't have the same cover as apixaban. You may be on apixaban for a good reason. So I would leave things as they are. Thank you. No, exactly. exactly. And I think, I think I agree. And I think also um, there's, we often have discussions as to patients that should be on anticoagulation and antiplatelet therapy. And again, there are very, very specific indications why that should 
uh, be the case. And so it's certainly not um, customary to have patients on both because whilst it may protect you against thrombotic, it will increase your bleeding risk as well. So um, being on dual treatment is also not, not wise without discussion with, uh, with the people involved in your, in, in your care. I'm just going to have a look and see what other questions that we may not have answered. Um, okay. Okay. That's from Arvind, actually. So okay. Is that Arvind? Is that you asking about the timing of the third, third primary vaccine? Is that on? Is that for the purpose of everybody in terms of of, of your question? Your yes, I, I don't think we covered it. Is what yeah. I thought. So I just thought I put it out so that okay. everyone. Uh, Arvind, do you want to talk about that? Do you know about it? You no, no. I mean, it's ideally eight weeks after the second dose. Is that right, Martin? Uh, it, it, yeah but that's what's recommended but again you know that's that's another thing some of some of them uh, is is nowadays we are getting it from the six months isn't it it's nearly six months second since our second vaccine yeah. is, is now so we are all pretty much into six months from the time we are but uh, you know from the from eight weeks onwards but it, it, you, even if it is off uh, you know if it is four months, five months, or six months, we we have you know take it as soon as it's been offered to you. So that's the that's the take home message uh, because we we never managed this uh, eight weeks business even with the second dose um, um, in our places, isn't it? So from eight weeks, it can be if it is a vaccine rather than a booster. For booster, which is a different, which is always they say six months. So if after the third, if it is going to be a booster, then it's going to be six months. But the third vaccination, again, it's it's it can vary. Yeah. That's my my take home, sir. But it's keep changing the duration, sir. We are all anyhow out around six months from the second. Yeah, I think that's my understanding of it as well. As the invitations will all come from six months. Um, the 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 chat's drying up a little bit. So if anyone in the audience wants to ask a few more questions in the chat, uh, there's one that came up earlier, which I have to say I didn't know the answer to, and I've had a look at. Um, and, um, and the question is how statins interact with ET, and I have to say. I, I didn't know the answer to that. What I would say is what I did know is that in that's almost it's almost as important um, when managing someone's ETs. We're doing that. We, you know, we're doing one. We, if you like, it's a kind of it's a, it's a two way street. We're doing one side of things by trying to control the blood counts, trying to control the hematocrit. But there are kind of lifestyle issues that, that on the other side, uh, patients need to do. So things like it's just as important uh, for things like smoking cessation and um, exercise and um, weight control. Um, but we also ask GPs to manage the other risk factors such as uh, blood pressure and cholesterol. So in terms of statins and tract with ET, well, I had only ever told patients that, you know, that their other risk factors need to be um, addressed from, from primary care. They should be addressed. And so therefore, if they've got cholesterol, it needs to, it needs to be treated. Um, but when I looked up in the specific question about statins and their interaction with ET, it does actually look like statins, did not know this, statins have been demonstrated to reduce the JAK2 allele burden in patients with ET. So it seems to have, for some reason, a direct um, effect on, sorry, Harton, if you want to. So that's that so far has been shown only in the laboratory type of things, in vitro rather than in vivo type things, as far as my knowledge goes. Most of those data are where the statin cell, you know, like statin is a stimulatory functions has got it and it has got uh, apoptotic features and things. But to my knowledge is predominantly most of these data are, are uh, from uh, um, in vitro or in the laboratory data uh, rather than many uh, clinical trial data has shown any, any, any direct impact or mutations or anything directly associated. But it looks it's good, so it's uh, as Norman said, clinically it is good. So you know there is nothing to stop you from taking it. That might should be the take home message. Yeah, I saw that there was a paper published in Blood looking 876 ET patients, and it actually showed that their allele burden actually did fall. And and but what it actually said was, and we were discussing why this should be the case. It actually showed that there was improved overall survival in those patients on statins compared with with um, with the control group, uh, but there was no 
improvement, there was no reduction in thrombotic events. And I couldn't quite work out why that might be the case, but Rachel had some views as to why that might be the case. Well, I felt it was more that it comes back to the, you know, the cardio, uh, you know, the cardiac risk, isn't it? It's, you know, we optimise all the risk factors. And I wondered whether it was more related to that, but I haven't read the paper in full to be able to sort of give my, uh, you know, a, a very articulate opinion on it. But uh, it's, it's interesting. It's certainly a huge number of patients. And I think it is something that, um, will require further investigation. So actually, it was an excellent question. Whoever asked that, thank you. Um, it's um, you know, it's it's it is very interesting to see sort of you know, but it's it's it's, it's what 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 has effect on or has an effect on what it is. It's hard to know. Um, you know, statins drop your cholesterol. You know, you're optimizing your cholesterol, so you're much less likely to presumably have a you know a heart attack um, and have sort of cardiac problems. But you know, or is it actually having a direct effect um, you know on on the allele burden itself? And again, there's, and actually there's another question about allele burden. Yeah, do you want to talk about allele burden? Well, about, again, it's, about, it's again, do we measure allele burdens in the in the UK? Uh, is because they do it in the US? Do we do it? Is it standard practice in the UK? And if and is it important? Do you want to just I, I mean, I, 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 I'm happy for Hartin or Arvin to say that I think it's this is this is this often comes up, and I think different centres, some centres don't measure allele burden itself, and others do. Um, we are we're not entirely clear about the effect it has. I know that there are some studies that can show that the allele burden can drop, and I think it's is that with Pegasus. I think it yeah, has been exactly. in terms of in papers, and and so I think, and that's and that's in uh, that's. I think that's the basis for the PV. I think that's where, in terms of that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so it's not really entered clinical practice. So as as Rachel says, she 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 heads up the diagnostics lab, and our diagnostics lab will they can give an allele burden, but it's not a routine clinical test in most in most laboratories. So a diagnosis, they will give you a Jack two, and it's a positive or a negative. In the background, they can do an allele burden, but actually we don't monitor patients by their allele burden. But there was um, what we looked at. There was a trial again mentioned in known as introductory slides, the Tamarin study which was looking at the role of uh, a tablet that they use in breast cancer called tamoxifen. And that drug was demonstrated to actually reduce the amount of, um, reduce the, the allele burden in vitro. So as Harton says, in, in the laboratory, if you take a JAK2 positive population of cells and treated them with tamoxifen, the amount of JAK2 fell. So they wondered whether that actually worked if you gave it to patients and that's not been published yet. Um, but, uh, um, but yes, a lot of these drugs. So um, I don't believe that drugs like hydroxycarbamide are thought to reduce the allele burden, but drugs that are immune modulating like Pegasus, uh, Pegasus interferon, they are, um, they are, um, uh, they, they do reduce the allele burden. Someone's asking, what is an allele burden? It's the percentage of JAK2, the percentage of cells within your marrow that are JAK2 uh, mutated. So it's, if you like, it's a sort of, it's a surrogate of what we call the amount of disease around. So, you know, typically patients may have 30, 40, 50% JAK2. Um, it, yeah. Exactly. I mean, depending on the disease process. Exactly. So PV will have even higher. Um, so it depends on the disease process. What we don't know is at the moment we treat to blood count targets. But yes, in 50 years time, they may laugh at that and say, you know, they only use a blood count as a guide. Nowadays, we use, you know, 50 years from now, they will only possibly look at allele burdens as your, as your treatment response. We have one, we're running short <laughs> in the most amazing interaction. And it, it's, it's wonderful that these questions are going around the world and answered to patients around the world. One, one last question, please, um, Norman, then we have to... to okay, have of it. course. Um, do we have, uh, well, let's see what we've got here. Um, do we have any insights about patients with CALAR mutations rather than JAK2, particular in terms of treatment and rates of success? Um, oh, that's uh, who wants to take that one? Absolute silence from the panel. Um, yeah, so yeah, so I mean, it, it, th th this is really difficult, and I'm not even sure that I feel confident answering this question. Yes, we know that that Jack Two is is a much is the is one of the the biggest drivers. So people. 
people with the JAK2 mutation are more likely to get thromboembolic events than those people who are not JAK2 mutated. CALAR and MPL, and in fact, some, some disease stratifications actually have low risk patients. If they are not, if they are not JAK2 mutated, they are even less likely to get thromboembolic mutations. So some people would even argue that there's a very, very low risk ET subgroup that do not even necessarily need antiplatelet therapy. That is not UK standard practice in the UK. So in the UK, everyone, irrespective of your mutational status, will get um, antiplatelet therapy. But there is a view, um, internationally, there's a subgroup view that actually very, very low risk non-JAK2 mutated patients uh, who are, are CALAR mutated, um, so young CALAR mutated patients actually may not necessarily need antiplatelet therapy. But that's, um, that's we're getting into non-UK practice. Um, but it's a good question. Okay, and we're now at okay. six. So I think we should wrap this up. So yeah, I, 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 I would just like to reiterate and say and a huge thank you to all of you. It's been for everybody watching the most amazing interaction and um, we're full of some really useful information. What more can I say on behalf of the patient community? Thank you. You know, all it remains for me to say on behalf of MPN Voice, a huge thank you to everyone uh, in our community for all your ongoing support and particularly to all the cl clinicians who I'm agree, I think you would agree with me, have made a fantastic presentation today um, and have gen generously um, often spend a lot of time helping MPN patients. Um, and, you know, we are still in a phase, as Rachel pointed out, of the pandemic. And, you know, they are hugely um, overworked in many cases, but we do rely on them so much. It is appreciated by every single one of us. Um, and also, it is really my heartfelt thanks to you all for all your help that you give us all the time. I would also like, and I know this is this is um, important to all of us here that who have been organising this. Danny, a huge thank you to you and and your team um, at Guys and St Thomas's um, Commercial Services. These forums are building, and I'm sure that when you upload it onto YouTube, there will be many people who will get a lot out of the forum that we've done today. In the meantime, all I have to say is a huge thank you. We look forward to seeing you all again soon. And uh, the most important message from me is stay well and keep safe. Goodbye.